Our presenter today is Dr. David Smith, a consultant and retired Air Force officer. David draws from his dissertation research with the Center for Values Driven Leadership to share about the role of culture in successful organizations. Here is David Smith. A few years ago, Tom Walter, CEO of Tasty Catering in Chicago, had a painful task. It was during the economic downturn, and the numbers were in, and the numbers were not good. Everyone, including representatives of the employees, had agreed that if the numbers reached a certain level, that five employees had to go. So Tom went to one of the teams, talked to the supervisor, a lady named Mari Carmen, and he said, okay, Mari Carmen, the time has come. I'm going to come back in a bit. Give me the five names. So when he returned and asked for the names, Mari Carmen said, Tom, we've known that this day is coming. We've all been looking for work because we knew that if five of us could find jobs, then everyone would be okay, we could all feed our families, and the company would save the money. But Tom, there's no work. We cannot find jobs. We have to feed our families, and we're not going to lay anyone off. Now, can you put yourself in Tom's shoes for just a moment? He said he thought, Marty Carmen, how can you do this right here in front of everyone? Everyone is looking. So what do you think a typical CEO, a typical executive, would do at that very moment? As Tom stood there struggling with what to do, he remembered that the culture and the values at Tasty had been designed and chosen by the employees themselves. And he remembered that the number one value is always moral, ethical, and legal, and the number two value is respect. Further, privately owned Tasty had embarked on a radical program of financial transparency. One wall of the lunchroom was covered with financial data, and they had a training program so that all the employees could understand the numbers that were on the wall. In fact, Tom says that even the dishwashers at Tasty can read and understand a profit and loss statement. So I asked Tom, what was going through your mind just in the last seconds before you responded? And he said he was thinking about how the staff and the culture are so integral with Tasty's success, and that if he as a leader violated the culture and the values, the place could come unraveled. So he looked at Mary Carmen and he said, Mari Carmen, what should we do? Now, stop and think about that for just a minute. This is the CEO of a privately held company asking an hourly supervisor what to do about his company's financial crisis. Mari Carmen responded. She said, Tom, we have talked about it among the team. All of us will reduce our hours to 25 hours a piece. We, that, at le that level, we can all feed our families, and you will receive, you will save seven employee equivalents, not just five. Tom was amazed. This was an elegant solution, and it came with the support, through Marty Carmen's leadership, of the whole team. So he agreed with the plan, and he also agreed to use the employee loan program at a reduced interest rate so that all those who had reduced their hours could pay their rent on time, clothe the kids, and pay their medical expenses. This story contains elements of the things that I found in my research of companies with outstanding culture. You know, as someone who has led organizations, I wanted to know what I could learn from these executives. As a researcher, I wanted to know something that was behind the curtain, something a little bit deeper than what we get at the typical uh, business book in the airport. So what did these executives do? They took responsibility for and owned the culture and the values. Like Tom, they spent significant time and energy and even organizational resources on culture and values. You know, many leaders think, hey, I'll get to that soft culture stuff 
after my business reaches a certain level. But these guys think exactly in the reverse. They think it starts with the values and the culture, and then the financial side, those are lagging indicators of how well we're doing the values and the culture. The leaders also gravitated to values that are self-reinforcing. In other words, not all values are created equal. It wasn't the values like teamwork, responsibility, accountability, even excellence that animated and gave life to these cultures. Instead, it was values like care, compassion, respect, dignity, meaning at work, service, integrity. Those were the things that animated the cultures. And in fact, it was the consistent practice of respect and dignity at Tasty that emboldened Mari Carmen to speak up to Tom. These leaders also integrated the values into all their organizational systems. Everything from recruiting to hiring to goal setting, training, feedback systems, even firing. They tried to do everything they could as consistently as possible with their values. I think the most interesting thing that I found was how they strategically kept the focus and kept the conversation on values. And they even operated on a mental model. Although it varied from one executive to another, they operated on a mental model that was something like this. They had, the, if we get the values right and the culture right, and we treat employees consistently with those values and culture, then those values will be transmitted outside the four walls of the company into the outside world to the customer and through the customer into the marketplace and good things are going to come back into our company as a result. In other words, the values were fully integrated into the economic value production of the company. At some of these companies, I was tempted to say that the culture is the business. So what happened at Tasty? Well, the hours were reduced, the jobs were preserved, and the crisis was averted. Later, Mari Carmen was promoted to the assistant to the executive chef, the second most responsible position in the culinary department. Tom says it's because of her quiet, positive, and powerful leadership and the care that she shows for everybody around her, but at the same time, maintains very high performance standards. I said earlier, I wanted to look behind the curtain, find a little bit deeper answer. So I didn't find a checklist. And I found some things that, while each leader did them a little bit differently, they're relatively easy to describe and they're doable. So why aren't more executives doing them? Well, it could be just because it's hard work. You know, it's really hard work to be consistent in every conversation in every venue, in good times and bad, around things like care, compassion, dignity, respect, integrity, service, meaning at work. It's hard work. It could also be because it's kind of counterintuitive for most of us as business leaders. It's counterintuitive that if I do this soft stuff, that somehow it might affect the hard side of the business. So one day, at Tasty, the marketing director came in to Tom's office and she put a new box of business cards down on his table. And he looked at them and, it's, and the title no longer said Chief Executive Officer, it said Chief Culture Officer. And he asked her, what's up with this? And she said, if we do the values right, we don't need a president and we don't need a CEO. So in today's volatility, change, and uncertainty, you know, our natural reaction is just to double down on the hard business facts. But maybe your CEO, like Tom, will find that they have the wrong title and adopt a model of values-driven business from the inside out.